Redford! What? What are you doing? Where? Where's my monster game? Th no monster game. We've moved on from that. This is Chai. T for two. But I want my monster game! Wait. T? Are you serious? Redford, don't, don't you have somewhere else to be? Something else to do? Whatever. I'm a coffee guy anyways. Hello, friends. Sorry about that. Redford, he just has a mind of his own. When you think about epic duels, you think lightsabers, fast cars, clashing swords. T? Yep, T. Let's do this. This is Chai, T for two. Okay, so today we're going to take a look at Chai T for Two from Steep Games. They were kind enough to send me this copy for review, so let's review it. At its core, this game is a worker placement game. Your workers are dice. Let me give you a brief overview of what's going on in this game. As the name implies, this is a two-player game. You are dueling merchants in a race to produce the finest tea and ship it to the rest of the world. You'll score points by loading your tea onto crates and onto ships that will set sail to infinity and beyond. Okay, maybe not that far. The entire process happens on your player board. When you acquire tea, it goes on the bottom of your board. Then as the game progresses, you move these tokens and those you acquire up on their appropriate path until it reaches the very top and they get loaded on ships or crates to score points. The main board is composed of multiple parts. The harvest, the market, the palace, the harbor, and production. To start the game, you choose your game length by deciding how many ships you need to fulfill. Three is a short game, four is medium, and five is longer. To start a round, the first player moves the tea assistant clockwise one to three spaces on the harvest side of the board. This represents the harvest for that year. Both players then receive the tea pictured on the marker he lands on, plus a combination of additional tokens or moves up to the number printed on the token. Then that marker is flipped and put on the opposite side of the board in the furthest clockwise position. The merchant will travel to that side of the board after reaching the highest marker on the harvest side. Next, both players roll their dice simultaneously. Then, beginning with the player with the first player token, you take turns placing your tea workers on the board and resolving the actions. First is the market. Here, you can assign the dice of equal or higher value shown and take the tea plantation card. If you place a six, you draw the top three cards in the stack Choose one and put the other two back on top. These plantation cards are one way you'll move your tokens on your player board. You can put these cards around your board except on top. That spot is for ships. When you place a card in an available spot, it will move all matching T tokens up one space. Also, if there is a matching card in a spot that a token enters, it also moves it up again. Some plantation cards are flipped after activating. These remain inactive 
and have no effect until you flip them back. There are also crates. If a crate is in the same spot as a matching token, that token is immediately loaded onto that crate and stays there until the end of the game, or discarded if the crate is ever replaced. There are two other types of cards. One involves set collection, the other allows you to turn one type of tea to another. Let's move to the next part of the board, the palace. Here you can assign any dice value. These spots will let you move any tea card to another available slot around your board, swap any two existing cards on the board, take the first player coin, and flip all flipped cards face up on your player board. The harbor is where you'll reserve ships. To do this, place two to four dice in sequential order. Your opponent will have a chance to respond with their own sequence. Each of you may continue to respond to each other's placement as long as you have the dice. A higher sequence or a longer sequence will win the ship. The displaced dice will be moved to a different ship. These ships are taken at the end of the year. The last spot to assign your dice is the production board. This spot is the other way to move your T-tokens up the player board. Here, you'll place sets of matching dice, so two to four workers. The highest value set or longer set takes the highest spot. Depending on where your dice end up at the end of the year, you'll gain five, three, or two movement that you can spend on the tokens on your board. At the end of the year, you resolve the harbor, taking your ships and placing them on top of your board, which is the docks. Any T tokens waiting there are immediately loaded. You then resolve the production, moving tokens on your board based on your position on the production board. Any time a ship is fulfilled, it moves to your player area and the tokens are discarded. You will score the points on the ship at the end of the game. If anyone has fulfilled enough ships at this point to end the game, proceed to final scoring. Otherwise, you'll restock the market and shipboards, take back your dice, and the next year begins. Let's take a quick look at final scoring. Add up the points on the T plantation cards, either face up or flipped over. Add to that the points on your fulfilled ships. Finally, if using side A of your merchant card, receive one victory point for each T plantation card and fulfilled or unfulfilled ship that has a matching T type as the one printed on your merchant card. That's it, highest score wins. So, let's get to what you came here for. What do I think about Chai T for Two? Is it the weapon of choice for an epic duel? Maybe, let's find out. So, let me start off by saying that I did not play the original Chai, and you don't have to play the original Chai to enjoy Chai T for Two. So, let's just get that out of the way. I love it when a game is specifically designed for two players. The mechanics are nice and tight. The game flows well. The turns are quick. There's a lot of strategy and decisions to make, and you get that here in this game. There are just enough spots on the board to always do something on your turn, but by the same token, there are just enough spots on the board to prevent you from doing what you want on certain turns. Let's take a look at the first player spot on the board just as an example. Now, since the T plantation cards don't get replenished until the end of the year, what's on there at the beginning of the year, that's it. So, if you're the first player, you have to make a decision. Do you invest this valuable die to claim the first player marker and retain it? Or are you going to go for that one plantation card there that, that's going to help you move those markers up towards the ship and then just hope that your opponent does not take the first player marker and maybe you can take it the next turn. So I think that's where the dual aspect comes in in this game. You're always trying to think what is the other person going to do? What am I going to do with the dice I have? Is it worth going here? Is it worth going there? So you got to think about all these things. Now because this is a dice rolling game there's always the issue of randomness, right? You never know what you're going to roll, and whatever you roll is what you get. However, the game does a good job of helping you mitigate those dice rolls. You could always spend a, uh, a resource, or a T in this case, to change your die up or down by one. 
And you can do that as many times as you want as long as you have the T to spend. Also, the sixes roll into ones and the ones roll into sixes. So that's good to keep in mind. Now, the duel's not only going on on the market board for the plantation cards or over here for the first player marker. You also have a duel going on at the harbor for ships and you have a, another duel going on on the plantation board for movement points. So at the harbor, for example, you have to think, uh, do I go there first or do I wait and react to what my opponent is doing? Do you put your dice on a ship you don't really want in order to bait your opponent to challenge you and maybe waste his dice and then uh, you get displaced and you act, and then you put your dice on a ship you really want <laughs> you know so there's all this strategy and all this thinking going on and i love it it's such a simple game but there's a lot of moving parts i also like that you can choose your game length that's a pretty cool thing when a game has that. You can choose a short game, or you can choose a medium game, or a long game, whatever you decide to play. Another thing I look at in a game is the artwork. I mean, let's be honest, the artwork is the first thing that calls out to you, right? When the game is on the shelf, if it has uh, attractive art, you're gonna take a look at it. And this game, I mean, look at it. <laughs> what else is there to say? The game is pretty. It has a lot of color. Um, the box is nice, the artwork on the boards and the cards is super, super nice. And this is a prototype. Now, granted, it's probably very close to um, the final product, but the fact that the prototype looks this good just tells you how much uh, love and work has been put into this game. Uh, I, like the, I like the rule book also has a lot of color and it even has like a little story here at the beginning to set up the um, the theme and the background for the tea and the tea industry so that's a nice touch related to the artwork what about ease of play how easy is this game well you've probably already figured this one out but it is very easy to learn very easy to play the iconography on the board that tells you what each die does is simple to understand, it makes a lot of sense. You only need to go over it once and you'll understand it. And if you have any doubt, the rule book will explain what the cards do, what the icons mean, and you may need to refer to it once or twice, but after that, you're not gonna have a problem. Now I should mention the player boards are double-sided. There's an A side and there's a B side. The B side I wouldn't say is uh, harder, it's just uh, more challenging. So once you've got the game mechanics down, you want a little bit more of a challenge, switch over to the B side, uh, check the rules for the changes, and you're good to go. The character cards also have an A side and a B side. The A side will score you points. The B side gives you a special ability, and they are all outlined in the rule book. The game also comes with a solo mode. Uh, it has these AI cards. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to try the solo mode before this review. I wanted to but I wasn't able to. Uh, however, I am gonna spend more time with it and I will likely post my thoughts on the solo mode on my Instagram account. So go ahead and follow me there if you don't already. We've talked about all the great things about this game and how good it is, but is there anything I would change? Yes. However, they're very, very, very minor things. They're more like nitpicks than anything else and they don't affect the gameplay whatsoever. But I figured I mentioned them anyway. Let me show you what I mean. As you know, these plantation cards, some of them after they get activated, they flip over. So I found myself throughout the game flipping these back just to remember what was on the other side. And that made me think, wouldn't it be cool if there was an indicator on the back of these cards to let you know what was on the front? That would probably solve that problem. Uh, and since the cards are always face up anyway, uh, it wouldn't matter if the back told you what was on the front. Another very minor thing is I wish the ship cards had a different back than the plantation cards. Uh, just for sorting purposes, storing them, when you pull them out, you're setting up, you know which are the ship cards and which are the plantation cards from the back. Again, I said they were nitpicks. What do you expect? So in the end, I highly recommend Chai Tea for Two. It's on Kickstarter right now through June 4th. I'll have links in the description to the Kickstarter page if you're interested in backing it. You can also get to it from my Instagram, 
which I'll have links down below as well. So next time someone challenges you to a duel, you pull out your copy of Chai Tea for Two and let them have it. As always, thanks for watching. And if you enjoy this content, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe down below and hit that notification bell so you can be notified when we upload new content. So I hope you enjoyed Chai Tea for Two. I hope you back it and you have a lot of fun. That's it for now. We'll see you in the next one.